so yeah, uh, Chester uh, is introduced. Uh, I'll share a bit more about myself in a bit. Uh, but yeah, this is my first talk ever. So uh, if I sound nervous, it's because I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you know, in, in design communities, uh, this question that comes up every now and then, uh, and the question is, should designers code? Um, yeah, uh, and whenever this question comes up, it, it's quite a divisive and uh, controversial question. So there are always people who argue that, oh, no, like design purists, right? Designers should only design, focus on that one skill. And then there are people who say, no, 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 no. Um, designers need to learn how to code, need to like, expand their skills horizontally. Um, yeah. But that's not a question that I'll talk about today. I want to explore the flip side of the question, which is, um, should engineers design? And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like for, for me, in engineering communities, I feel like I don't really hear people asking this question a lot. Like, I don't really hear engineers asking, should engineers design uh, that much? At least that's my personal experience. Um, but for myself, like, this is a question that I've asked myself a lot over the years. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think like, I finally figured an answer that I'm satisfied with, and that's what I'm here to share with you guys today. Yeah. So uh, this question is a little bit vague, so let's better define some of these terms. Yeah. Uh, so firstly, uh, by design, I'm referring specifically to UI UX design, and not like system architecture design, not like design patterns, not, not the refactoring guru stuff. Um, yeah, so software engineering design. Uh, sorry, UI UX design. Gosh, um, and then by engineers, well, there are a lot of different engineers out there. There are, a lot of, there are many engineering roles, but I'm specifically referring to front end engineers. Yeah. So this is our uh, more precise topic for the day: Should front end engineers design bracket UI UX? Yeah. So uh, before we begin, I want to do a quick poll um, on the audience here. Uh, how many of you would consider yourself a designer or you're aspiring to be a designer? Raise your hands. Okay, all right, a few hands, a few hands. Very cool. Okay, uh, how many of you would consider yourself an engineer or you're an aspiring engineer? Raise your hands. Oh, a lot more hands, a lot more hands. Okay, the rest? Not engineering or design? That's cool. Okay, okay, how, how, how many of you would consider yourself both an engineer and a designer? Awesome, I see a few hands as well. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I think I'm talking to the right crowd then. Uh, so, you know, why, why this topic, right? Why, who am I to talk about this? Uh, well, uh, allow me to probably introduce myself and then you know why I'm so passionate about this topic. Uh, yeah, so like many of you here, I think, uh, I studied computer science in NUS and I graduated very, very recently. <laughs> yeah, and I'm currently working full time at a startup called Mobin. Uh, I'm working as a software engineer, and uh, yeah, Mobin is a company started by some of my seniors, I guess, so they are your seniors as well. Um, pretty cool place. Uh, more on Mobin at the end of the talk. Yeah, um, but yeah, so this is me as an engineer. Uh, on the flip side, I would consider myself a hobbyist designer. Uh, hobbyist because I have no formal training in design. Uh, but I started learning how to code in Poly, and ever since then, I always found myself quite drawn to the design aspects of my projects in school, or like side projects, or client projects, anything. I, I do enjoy the design side of things as well. And uh, so I've done design for quite a while, but yeah, hobbyist, not, not a professional. Um, I'm also an unofficial, well, officially I'm a software engineer, that's my job title. Uh, that's what I was hired to do, but uh, I also do a bit of design at Mobin as well. Uh, it's very unofficial, of course. Um, well, it, I mean, I guess in startups, it's quite common to wear many hats. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I get to do a bit of design here and there uh, at, at, at work. Uh, lastly, I run a design-related newsletter, um, it had, which has about 2,000 subscribers now, which is pretty cool. Um, but more, more on that at the end as well. Yeah, uh, so this slide is, is me, right? This slide sums up me in a nutshell, it's very concise, uh, but uh, as you can see, I'm pretty involved in both engineering and design. Uh, I really enjoy both areas, and uh, that's why this question, should front-end engineers design, is something that I'm very passionate about, and uh, it's a question that I've wrestled with many times over the years. Yeah. So, right, 
So I do both, and that's why you should do both too, right? Thank you for coming back that talk, right? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not quite satisfied with the answer, and I don't think you guys are either. So uh, let's let's dig a bit little deeper into this. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's do a quick game. Um, I call it uh, well, not not a very creative title. I call it designer or engineer. Um, so I'll show you some design details, uh, and then I want you guys to guess if it was implemented by a designer or an engineer. Yeah. Uh, everyone clear? It's pretty clear, right? Okay. So first, first design detail, the blinking hex cursor. Yeah, I think uh, all of you guys should be familiar with this. Anyone who has used the phone or used the computer, you'll be familiar with the blinking hex cursor, right? It's a like cursor that's always blinking, and it's really daunting when you're trying to write an essay, staring at it, and it stares back at you. Uh, so why is this a design detail? Let's start, let's start with a similar question, sorry. So why does it blink? Does anyone know why the blinking text cursor blinks? Easy to find. Easy to find? To show that it's working, but it's not blinking. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, yeah, you guys pretty much got it. Um, it's a variety of reasons, but yes, these are some of the reasons. Like, I guess you're just staring at your Word document of 3,000 words. Um, like, how the am I supposed to know where my cursor is if it's not blinking, right? So, the blinking, when it blinks, it draws attention to the cursor so you know where it is. And then, if you notice, when I'm typing, the cursor stops blinking, right? So, why does it not blink when I'm typing? Anyone want to take a guess? It'll be distracting. Yeah, yeah. There's no need to blink, it'll be distracting. Exactly. Because you already know where your cursor is when you're typing. It's looking at it already. So when it's blinking, if it blinks while you type, it's kind of distracting. Yeah. So I think we can all agree that this is a design detail, right? Like, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So who came up with this design detail? Was it a designer or an engineer? You guys want to take a guess? Engineer. Engineer. Okay. One one for engineer. Anyone says designer? Okay, a few, a few people vote for designers. Anyone say this? Uh, anyone say any other guesses? <laughs> okay, cool. Well, um, surprise, surprise, it was implemented by an engineer. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, good job, good job, Sajjan, the friend. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do I know this was uh, invented by an engineer? Uh, firstly, the blinking text cursor is not something that is new to modern computers. It's not something that's new to modern interfaces. Uh, in fact, it was introduced, it was patented in 1969, uh, back when computers didn't look like this, right? They, all, all you had was a terminal that you interact with by typing. And so that was when the big text cursor came about. And back then, uh, I don't think there were designers doing any of those. And the, and the guy who patented it was an engineer, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's our first example. Uh, second example. This is a video of uh, Vercel. I don't know if you guys have used Vercel before. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, the CEO of Vercel. Very famous guy on Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure about the Vue.js. Not sure about the Vue.js guy. But yeah, um, anyway, this is a video of Vercel. Uh, in this video, um, when you pick a uh, behavior, so the default option is automatic, right? So when you pick um, only build that there are changes in the folder, uh, the text you get is automatically focused on, and the text, the file path is selected. So this is a design detail because it allows you to immediately start typing and change the file path. And it's kind of like a preemptive action, so it saves you a few steps. If they didn't automatically focus and select on it, you would have to Click into the text area, select the text itself, or backspace and delete the text and then type. So, uh, because it preemptively, preemptively predicts what you want to do, uh, and it does it well, and it gives like a nice little design detail. Yeah. So, uh, before we take take a vote, right? Are we all on the same page that this is a design detail? Anyone says no? Okay, thank goodness. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's vote, right? Uh, who do you think this was done by? Was it done by a designer or an engineer? Designer? Okay. Designer? Engineer. Okay. 
engineering. Okay, so uh, the answer is engineer. <laughs> uh, I think you can see where this is going. Uh, but I know it's an engineer because I follow him on Twitter and he posted this video uh, sharing his work that he did. So uh, this little detail was done by an engineer. Um, I think it's not hard to guess that it's done by an engineer as well because, uh, well, I guess engineers would be more familiar with what other engineers want out of this. But I mean, uh, I don't think designers would be too familiar with uh, Git CLI commands. Yeah. Uh, sorry if any designers are here. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, last example. Uh, this is uh, this is Mobin. This is the website that I'm working on at work. Um, and uh, in this example, we have each of these uh, boxes is uh, we call them an app cell. So when you click on the app cell, you go to a new page. Yeah. So in the app cell, there's carousel of screens which you can navigate using arrow keys. Right. And if you click to the last screen, and then you accidentally skip the same spot, you're not led to the page. It's like it's like a safety mechanism, right? So uh, call it like a safe zone. So if, if you spam click and then the error disappears, you accidentally click on the cell, you're not led to the page. Yeah. And well, a safe zone, if you leave the safe zone there, it becomes a date zone, right? So if I try and click on the page, I mean I try and click on the area data and I actually want to go to the page, then it's a date zone. I won't be able to click on it. I'll be wondering what's going on. So when you hover away, oh, let's wait for the video to loop back around. So click, 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 that's a basic thing, right? So when you move your mouse out of the safe zone and you move it back in then it's no longer a safe zone, it's like you can safely click on it, yeah. So uh, this is a uh, design detail, can we agree on that? Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, let's take a vote for the last time. Uh, who do you think came up with this? Was it an engineer or a designer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are smart. Yeah, this was done by me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm an engineer, okay, my job title is software engineer. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, these are the examples uh, of design details done by engineers. And so, uh, no, other engineers do both. That's why you should do it too, right? No, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's not be content with that answer, right? Uh, I think I can do better than that. So, let's dig even deeper, right? So, um, no, let's, let's go back to first principles for a little bit, right? Let's ask the question, right? Now, how did UI, UX design and software come to be? Yeah. Um, and I think if we answer, if we answer this question, it will give us a better idea of, uh, of things. Yes. So, in the beginning, I'm um, just kidding. Uh, so, the first computer did not come with a GUI. This is not the first computer, by the way. This is just some random image I found of an old computer. Um, right. Uh, did not come with a GUI. A GUI is a graphical user interface, and uh, it's a screen, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, as you can see, in the early days, computers didn't have screens. You interacted with it with, I don't know what, toggles, buttons, sliders, a lot. This is very really complex, it's beyond me. Um, but it was only much later down the line that graphical user interfaces became a thing. So this is an ad of an old Apple computer. Uh, I don't even see, but there's a kind of a screen there, and all that the screen has is some text, right? It's just words, it's just, it's just a terminal. Uh, back then, the Interfaces were basic and simple like that, and so the engineers were the designers, right? And that was okay because uh, well, there wasn't much designing required. Yeah. So over the years, hardware started getting better, screens started getting bigger, and uh, the UI started supporting more complex interfaces, right? So you can see this is uh, 1982, right? In 1982, screens really were this complex, right? Apple computers could display pie charts, bar charts, graphs, a lot of new stuff, right? So, as screens started getting so complex, you know, we started to realize that um, engineering and design require two very different skill sets. You know, being good at one does not equate to being good at another. Yeah. So, case in point. Okay, I, I don't know if this is real or not, but. If I told you that this was designed by an engineer, you would believe me, right? <laughs> um, well, you know, it's not just about aesthetics. Uh, a well-designed interface directly impacts your company's bottom line. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but I think you guys can agree. Um, so, once we realized that you know design matters and engineers are, you know, probably not the ones that you want handling design, uh, companies started to hire professionals to handle the design side of things. Um, 
and that's how UI UX designers came to be, right? Uh, okay, that was a super condensed version. Uh, I'm sure the history is a lot more complex and interesting. So, yeah, but the point is, the point is, like, we want to answer this question, right? How did UI UX design and software come to be? And to me, the answer is it came to be because we realized that designing software and building software require two very different skill sets. You know? Yeah. And, and so this brings us to today. Today, uh, designers design and engineers build. Uh, this is the current set of things in the world. Um, but you now I want to pose a question, right? Is this the ideal state? And to me, I think it's not the ideal state because if you think about it, it's kind of inefficient. We're doing the same work twice. Now, what, what do I mean by that? So designers spend so much care and effort to make a beautiful prototype, make a beautiful mock-up in Figma or Sketch or whatever app they use. And then what do engineers do? Yeah, they do the exact same thing but on a different medium. Yeah, so uh, I'll show you a little video now that kind of illustrates that. funny but I think it quite accurately uh, brings about my point right we're doing the same thing twice right the, the designer has done it so beautifully in Figma right so much care and so much joy um, and the uh, engineer is recreating the exact same thing with so much pain um, in HTML and CSS right it's just a different medium but literally it's the exact same thing done twice yeah so you no know, I think we have to ask right, why, why is this non ideal state the norm right if you think about it so many big companies out there, they have enough resources to do a lot of things, but yet this is the norm, right? This is the state of things that designers, design, engineers build. Why is this the norm? I think this is the norm because uh, design tools are not there yet. Yeah, what I mean by that? So, Figma, uh, I, I, I guess familiar with Figma, more or less, yes. So, for those who don't know, Figma is like, a, uh, it's like Photoshop on steroids, uh, and collaborative, um, so designers use it to do uh, make designs, I guess. I, I don't know how to better describe it. But it's a bread and butter of every designer, uh, almost every designer. And it empowers them to create beautiful design specs. But that's it. Not beautiful apps, right? It stops there, it stops there. Right? They can make beautiful prototypes and everything, but if an engineer doesn't translate those design specs into code, into an app, then it, it stays a prototype that will be seen by only the designers. Yeah. I mean, you can argue that yes, there are apps out there that allow designers to build the end product, right? Um, in the early days, I don't know if you guys know what is a uh, Blogger. Um, yeah, so Blogger and Tumblr are like one of the earliest stuff where you know you can kind of build your own website without any coding or minimal coding maybe. Um, and then later on, Neo sorry, Neo Cities. Neo Cities. Uh, oh, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with that. Oh. Yeah, so um, later on we, we have stuff like WordPress, Wix, but also you make blogs, right? With drag and drop editors. And then now we have like the, the really sexy tools like Webflow, Framer. And like I've seen some of the work that designers are doing with these things, and they are like really good. They're like mind blowingly good. Um, but there's one limitation that I always see, which is that what you can do with these tools, like even with the, the stuff like Webflow and Framer, it's usually static pages. Is landing landing sites, blocks, and stuff like that. You know, you don't really see many apps, um, apps that are built with Webflow and Framework with no code slash no code design tools. Yeah. So this is like, design tools are not there yet. They don't empower designers to build the apps themselves directly. They only empower them to design beautiful design specs. Yes. Okay. So. Back to our question, should front end engineers design? Well, if you think about what I just said, designers design and engineers build. If that's the case, right, 
then there's no room for design, engineers to design, right? Right? There shouldn't be any room right? if if it's so like siloed, right? Designers design, engineers build. So how come? How come? If so, then the, this question is completely void, right? Like the topic of this talk is completely. There's no answer to it anymore. But now let's let's go back to the examples we looked at earlier, right? The three examples we saw earlier: Green Texas, Vassell, Morgan. Right. These in these cases, the engineers were able to. They had room to do some design, some design details at least. And and why was that? I think in each example. Uh, each, each example illustrates uh, a unique scenario. Um, so in the first case of the painting text cursor, why was the engineer able to implement this? It's because back then, uh, GUI, graphical user interfaces, were, were a new domain, right? They were kind of new, uh, and engineers were the first people to explore that domain, first people to explore the limits of that domain, to find out you know, how much they can do with this. And so, when the engineers are the first ones there, in, oh, there's a lot of room for them to explore different things and play around with design details like this. Yeah, so new domains. In the second example of a cell, um, I think it's possible for an engineer to implement design details when you are building something for other engineers. So the target audience of this is other engineers, right? And so as an engineer, you know what other engineers want. And so you're the right person to be designing for other engineers. Not not a whole app, of course. Not a whole app. Unless you're a really good designer. Um, but for some parts, small design features like this can be implemented by engineers. And then lastly, in the case of Mobin, like why was why why was I able to like how did I have room to implement design detail? But the thing is, when I received the design specs from the designer, this, this wasn't part of it, right? The clicking, the save zone, the date zone, stuff like that. That wasn't part of it. And well, it's not the fault of my designer, really. It's because, you know, going back to the, the point I mentioned earlier, the design tools are not there yet. Yeah. Like Figma is great, but Figma doesn't allow you to handle everything that the web does. So uh, Figma allows you to do like hover states and stuff like that, but I don't think it allows you to do stuff like focus or like mouse enter, mouse leave events, um, a lot more complex stuff. And I guess, um, if you're a designer who doesn't code, like these things are not immediately intuitive to you as well. And if you were to not with something Figma, um, like think about what how a designer would mock this up, right? He would design the each app cell, and then like he's not going to design the linking of the like, clicking on the cell to go to the new page. So it's something that he might not discover. Yeah, and so how can I do? Well, design tools are not there yet. Back to the same point as well. Yeah. And like once again, it's not a fault of designers, it's a limitation of their tools. Right. And when you build UI in Figma in a design in a design tool, it's very different from building it in a uh, like production app. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's very different from, from doing it in a in a production environment because design specs live in isolation. Right, you design something. You usually, design isolation. Maybe you, let's say you, you do like a like a little drop down menu, right? You design a drop down menu on one or two screens at most, right? But what if drop down menu appears on like like sixty screens in there? You're not gonna do that, right? And like I mean, you guys know what like uh, decision decision trees are, right? I mean, if you branch out every single possible UI state, that's like just crazy amount of work. So it's not it's not the designer's fault, but rather it's a limitation of the tools. And that's why I say. Because design tools are not there yet, there's room for engineers to design. So, revisiting our topic for the last time, right? should front-end engineers design regular UI UX? Um, well, my answer is yes, and this is an answer that I've found for myself, and I am satisfied with. Uh, but, no, maybe that's not your answer, and that's okay. Um, if you notice, the title of my talk is a question and not a statement, right? I didn't say why front-end engineers should design. I said, should front-end engineers design? Because I want to pose this question to you. Like, um, like for me, I found an answer that I was satisfied with, and I want to encourage you guys to find an answer that you were satisfied with as well. Maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you think that engineers should not touch design at all. It's OK. Um, maybe you think that, oh, back-end engineers should design. Maybe that's your philosophy, right? I think. Go for it, go and explore 
um, think about what matters to you, think about what's important to you. Um, yeah, and uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, I think it's pretty quick. <laughs> okay, maybe not so quick, but thanks. Um, but okay, before I end, before I end, a uh, bit of a, a few, a few, just want to plug a few things. Um, so, uh, I mentioned that I work at Mobile, uh, and I think it's very fortunate to be in a company that allows me to do both engineering as well as play around with some design stuff. And uh, you know, if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, uh, you know, welcome to join us at Mobile. Uh, full disclosure, that's my referral link. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, if you're interested, you can scan that and see see what positions we're hiring for and. Uh, you know, if, if what, what I've talked about today sounds interesting to you, yeah, definitely come and apply. Yeah. Um, don't worry, QR code will see me on the screen. Um, so the other thing is that I mentioned that I run a design-related newsletter. Um, it's called Design Spells. Uh, I just started it like a couple months ago. Uh, it's been quite fun. So what Design Spells is, is that uh, it showcases, well, design details that feel like magic, okay, but that doesn't say much. Um, so what we showcase is like fun little, UX details or UI details in apps because um, I think the web is getting kind of boring uh, but all these fun little easter eggs uh, what gives them a bit more personality yeah uh, so if you want to subscribe and use that then you can scan that drive code um, yeah that'd be pretty cool uh, last but not least uh, you follow me on twitter uh, my handle is not just uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, or you can I mean if you want to reach out to me you can Message me on Telegram or so at the same handle. Uh, and uh, this is a sneak peek on my website, so you can scan that QR code on my website. Sorry, there are a lot of QR codes, but I, I think it's better than typing, right? Um, but yeah, anyway, with that, that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you so next up, we have Kawei, who is a senior software engineer at a financial institution. And uh, today she's going to talk about two front-end side projects that she built. And uh, the catch is that she said that most of it is coded by ChatGPT. So along with sharing what she built, she also shared the insights that she had um, and programming with ChatGPT. So let's give a round of applause for her. Really interesting first talk. And I hope the app I built myself won't dishonor the statement that we made just now. So <clears throat> today I'm going to share with you um, two projects that I built. Um, I find it really hard to come up with a name because there's nothing in common of these two projects except that um, those are both happening in browsers and that I coded with ChatGPT. So um, bear with me for that. A uh, little bit introduction of myself. My name is Wei. Um, I'm from China, but I've been in Singapore for almost seven years. And for most of my experience as a web front end engineer, uh, I spent them in Shopee, just across the street. Um, currently, I'm at a financial institution. Um, in my spare time, I actually like to build things in a browser because anything that I don't end up on a website doesn't count. So I don't have just one website, I have like multiples of them. Um, I also own uh, a sticker shop, so if you're interested in random stickers, go check that out. Um, <clears throat> so what we'll be uh, sharing with you today are two side projects like I mentioned. Um, there's one commissioned by a designer and another that I kind of built by myself. Um, and then I'm going to share some light on um, how I feel about coding with ChatGPT because I'm a really new user to ChatGPT. I'm really excited and I kind of try to ask ChatGPT to do everything, including writing this talk. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in also hearing how that went also. Um, so Disclaimer, I'm not a GPT expert, nor am I an LLM expert, so I won't answer questions like whether I think ChatGPT will take over your job or whether your professors should ban ChatGPT for your homework assignments. Um, but I do think there's a difference um, in the way we work with or without this tool. 
just like there's a difference when Google came about and when Set Overflow came about. Um, I think we should respect those differences and then um, we should also try to think about how to uh, make those differences work towards us instead of replacing our brain. So, there you go. Um, the first project I have it was commissioned by a designer. So, um, if you're a front end engineer, you can hang out with a back end engineer, and if you're nice enough, maybe you end up writing CSS. But you can also hang out with designers, and if you don't end up fixing poorly written CSS, then you will probably end up writing JavaScript. So I had this designer friend of mine. Um, she's really cool. She got all the CSS covered. And um, she also has a boyfriend who's a back-end engineer. So she also got the JavaScript part covered. So, but one day she still came to me and she's like, um, I'm building my profile site. And I have this one final animation that requires the attention of a front-end engineer. So I wonder what that could be. Um, so she showed me this. Um, and then I was like, ha ha ha, nobody likes to write SVG. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, if you're a front end engineer, um, then your designer friend comes to you and say, um, this will really be the spark of my profile. What do you do? Um, you say, yeah, I'll ask Chap GPT to do it. So uh, let's take another look of the requirement. Uh, I think it's quite straightforward. So the website is at the backdrop, and she has this curve. Uh, the curve won't actually show up on her website, but it's intended as a path for a paper plane to uh, fly along. And then as the user scrolls down the page, uh, the paper is supposed to fly down, I guess. And then as you scroll back up, it's supposed to fly back. Um, but then to make it more natural, um, it makes sense for you to turn the plane tangent to the curve. Right? Um, so that's uh, what we're going to do. Um, let's brainstorm a bit together. Um, how would you go about implementing? One naive solution is um, maybe I can maintain a list of coordinates and I can just put it on an on-scroll event and then uh, attach that to the browser on scroll event and then uh, every now and then I'll, I'll move it to the uh, coordinate. This definitely will work, but it's also not very interesting because it will change your coding experience into number crunching. Um, so like I mentioned, um, there's probably some SVG magic to it. Um, but I don't work with SVG on a daily basis. I'm not super clear how to make that happen. And I'm also pretty sure someone out there has already written a library that does that. This is, um, this is pretty common uh, animation that you've seen around. So guess what ChatGPT said? Any guesses? Yes, it's a library. Um, <laughs> In particular, it actually told me about this library like more than three times. I mean, I prompted multiple times. I don't want just one answer. Um, it's actually a very mature library that you can try. But I mean, come on, bro, you can do better than this. So to my surprise, actually, this is my first ever experience building with ChatGPT. And within only a few like back and forth prompts, maybe people will call them. Um, it's able to give me this. And let me show you. Am I disconnected? Oh, okay. So, yeah, <coughs> so <coughs> to share with you a bit um, <coughs> how we reach here, basically, I asked ChatGPT to. Um, animate a plane as the user scroll, and then ChatGPT to say, oh, go ahead and use a library. And I went, oh, no, 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 let's do this on ourselves. And then he gave me an animation where uh, the plane kind of animates on, over uh, a straight line. 
So then I said, no, my animation is supposed to move along a curved line. Then it set up everything on um, SVG. Then um, I copied the SVG um, <coughs> to the path. Um, and then uh, I kind of asked it to um, turn the plane accordingly, and then uh, also asked it to uh, turn the plane according to the tangent. So it's quite impressive. I mean, only uh, less than 10 minutes time it was able to give me this um, first working copy. Um, <coughs> but when you copy homework, you definitely want to understand how that works. So <coughs> turns out it's using uh, the SVG path API of these uh, two uh, <coughs> functions. Um, first one is get total length. Uh, this will give you um, a length of any arbitrary paths that you define uh, in your SVG pass tag. And then um, <clears throat> with the total length, you can apply a fraction, which you will then grab from your on-scroll event. And then you can get a distance that you call get point at length width. And this will give you the x and y coordinate on the DOM. And now you can use that x and y coordinate to move whatever object that is um, <coughs> to the uh, desired location. So that's the crux of um, this implementation. So, oh, I'm glad I had a screenshot here. Um, so the implementation is quite straightforward. You get the path length and then you uh, you have the handle scroll um, callback function. Um, you grab your fraction and you get a point. And in order to calculate the tangent, you get the next point, which is your fraction plus a delta. And then uh, with the two points, you can calculate the tangent for the angle. And after you determine the direction based on your current position versus the previous <coughs> position, and you can apply either rotate 180 degrees or no rotation. And then everything, um, you just uh, you write a style to the DOM directly. Um, and finally, I asked GPT to give me a throttle because um, why not, right? Then I <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, applied the throttle with um, uh, the duration that I matched that with the CSS animation to give it like a smooth curve. So, yeah, so there you go. And see the plane fly out. And then you scroll back, it's gonna turn back. And then it's gonna pull the plane out. Yeah, so my friends got a new job with this already, so I'm really proud of this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the first project. Um, <clears throat> something I learned about this through this process is that you can actually get up and running pretty quickly with ChatGPT, and then you can spend most of your time kind of uh, fitting your solution to the actual ask. Um, I also feel a difference in the sense that I'm actually doing more uh, code review than actual coding. Um, <clears throat> Actually, the first versions of what GPT gives me is not very, <coughs> excuse me, it's not very accurate. So if you're good at co-reviewing, uh, co you can uh, point out what is the problem uh, faster, and then you can move along uh, more quickly. So I was just very, very impressed that I managed to get everything done like within a bus ride. I remember texting my designer over my pen bus ride, I'm like, oh, I don't have internet anymore, but uh, let me push this. So um, it was really impressive. But then at the same time, you are also taking away the opportunity to figure out the puzzle by yourself. And in this case, I already gave you the answer. Uh, GPT gave me the answer. But if you are um, more dedicated in finding out the puzzle piece by yourself, probably only check your answer with GPT. Yeah, so the second, moving on to the second project. Um, this one I built myself. Uh, I give it a name called Square a Cat. Um, it's kind of random, but I'll show you what it is. Um, excuse me for the bad gift, because 
um, it doesn't allow me to use uh, video. So um, anyway, um, outside of work, I'm also a dedicated rock climber. So um, I climb outdoors regularly. And apart from being a web developer, where anything that don't end up on the website don't count, anything that don't end up on Instagram also don't count. So uh, feel free to follow this fine gentleman. Here is my climbing partner. Um, <clears throat> every time we go out to climbing, and we come back on our bus ride, um, we will be curating like multiple uh, medias and probably posting on our Instagram. Then um, on this particular bus ride was about a month ago. Um, he asked me, well, how do you add borders to photos? And as a web developer myself, for more than a decade, I got really confused. Like, this, this is a border. Like, what do you mean borders? So it turns out he wants this. Because when you post multiple medias to Instagram, um, Instagram will force that all of your photos or videos to share a same aspect ratio such that their carousel doesn't have to resize. Um, but if your media has a mix of landscape and portrait mode, they don't share a same aspect ratio and your subsequent medias will be badly cropped out by the aspect ratio of the first, um, first media. So the only common ground is to put everything in a square. So that's why uh, we're asking for uh, putting the photo in a square. Um, so I did some non-committal GPT and Google search and tried to find services that can allow us to do this. Of course, there's a lot of paid apps. Um, I mean, talk to a developer about paid apps. Um, there's also online services. This one is actually very, very well done. It looks like it has been around for a while, and um, it has pretty much all the things you need to square an image. You can square with blur, you can square with a color, you can resize, and you can crop. Um, but at this point already, like on the bus track, I felt more like if only I had my laptop with me. So um, I'm sure somewhere out there, there are a ton of GitHub projects um, um, those are quite interesting to read, but I'm already dedicated to do this myself. So, um, again, let's brainstorm a bit. I kind of just want this app to live in my phone, um, web-based, because I'm a web front-end developer. Uh, the internet isn't great, but the network isn't that reliable, so um, ideally, I don't want any unnecessary network requests. I kind of want to have a functionality for you to upload multiple images. Um, and I want the carousel from uh, Instagram for me to play with. It's kind of like a preview of what my medias are going to look like. And then ideally, I want some um, like thumbnail gallery for me to navigate or like remove the item uh, that I don't <coughs> want. And then I want the color picker, of course. And apply button. Right. This, is, this is what I imagined. Um, so let's build it with ChatGPT. Um, the crux of this problem, by the way, I mentioned the word crux. I know there are a few rock climbers here. Crux of a climbing problem means the critical link that you need to solve to solve the problem. So the crux of this problem is probably the question well, can I really do this in the browser? Um, so that involves uh, uploading multiple images. And that shouldn't be a problem. We always upload files uh, through the browsers. Um, we also want to render the image in a square, which also shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you can probably do an SVG, or maybe as my friend suggested, you can do a border. It works. I tried last night. Uh, you can see this. This is border. Um, you can calculate the border of the image by the, like the difference of your width and height, and then you can render two borders on the side, and that will give you a square. 
Uh, it's not very performant, so don't take advice from a non-developer. But um, once you have a border, I mean, sorry, once you have a square, you're probably halfway done already because you can just take a screenshot. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to be satisfied enough with that. I don't want to. I don't want my friend to be, oh, I said, you're, you're a very bad developer, don't give me your app. So we want to rasterize the image um, for download. So we want to be able to do something like this. You can long press. Uh, this is given by the native um, of iOS. You can long press the image, and you can save, and that image will come in a perfect square. <coughs> So then, obviously, this isn't a crux for ChatGPT. Uh, it gives me this immediately. Um, it's actually kind of impressive. Uh, we'll read the code more later on. Um, but immediately after that, I interrogated ChatGPT a few more rounds to kind of try to see um, what are the other options, or try to find a prime option to do this. Of course, you can do Canvas. Um, you can rasterize image into various formats, and then you can um, <coughs> adjust the uh, image size and all that. Um, you can also do SVG, and SVG can be downloaded via a data URL. But the problem is the file you download will be an SVG, so you can't really use that directly to upload to Instagram. Um, you can do server-side rendering, but that's kind of out of the question. Um, and then you can do WebGL, of course, uh, but it's a bit overkill. Maybe a day two um, request. Um, there's web APIs and libraries, but uh, according to ChatGPT, they internally use this canvas. Uh, there's also a file block, but according to ChatGPT, they also render into a canvas. So we're roughly there, and I'm happy enough with canvas, so let's become a canvas developer. Um, Take a closer look of this key part of what is happening. Uh, what we're doing is when um, we're creating a canvas context, and then we're calling the canvas draw image API. Um, this process isn't really asynchronous, but we need to do this after the image is loaded. Um, so the unload callback has to be Result and that's an asynchronous fashion. So we need to have that in mind when we do our tech design with them. So this is the canvas draw image API. Once again, if you copy homework, you better understand what it is doing. Um, there are three different call signatures. You can draw image with a position. Uh, the second call signature have five params. Uh, it allows you to draw image at that position and supplying a size for your image. And then the final one, you can um, draw the image at that location, specify the size, and then you can crop the image. Uh, I think W3 schools gives you a very good example you can play around with. Um, so now, once we're ready to move along, build the actual product, um, yeah, like, guess how this went. <laughs> uh, I don't really have a slide for how this went, but I can tell you that this wasn't the most pleasing one hour of my life, wrestling with ChatGPT, trying to put everything in React. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the most struggle I had is that it actually loses context relatively quickly. And I'm also quite opinionated about how I organize my code. When GPT gave me the code, they kind of assumed that we put everything in a root directory, but I actually want my components in one directory and then my state management in another. But I didn't tell GPT to do that. So every time I need to copy and paste and then I need to make the changes, otherwise it will shout at me. And every time I change a variable name, um, my app will be like, oh, undefined is not a function, so that's not very fun. <coughs> Um, so um, I kind of put everything in React myself. Uh, I use a PW template with Create React app. Why? Because I want the app to kind of live in my phone. Um, I'm using React for component building because I'm a React developer. 
I'm also using Recoil for state management because Recoil is really cool. Uh, it's really good for a sync um, process. Just now we mentioned that drawing on canvas is not asynchronous, but the image loading is asynchronous. Um, so usually when we talk about asynchronous processes, we think about data loading. But I just found that using Recoil to manage this, even though it happens locally, but it's an asynchronous process, and it actually turns out to be really well. So let's take a look at the components. We have a carousel that will render canvas. And because it's rendering canvas, and because we're doing the gesture thing, uh, it's a bit, um, it needs to be performance aware. Then we'll have the gallery. I'm using SVG for this, um, not the borders. Thanks again for the advice. Um, it's actually quite performant. Um, surprisingly, it's very fast. I interrogated ChatGPT about why it's fast or so. It didn't give me a satisfying answer, so I'm still on track to learning about it. And then we have a color picker and the apply button. They kind of do the state management. And then last but not least, uh, I wanted to put the uploader at the end of my carousel. So the state management of this is relatively straightforward. I have a bunch of raw files. Um, this will be written by the up upload file component, and then it will be read by the rasterization process and the thumbnails. Same applies to the color. And then what's a bit special about the async selector is that it's a feature provided by Recoil. It allows you to select the raw files and the color from your atom. And then it also allows you to do some asynchronous process. And once that's done, it will update your uh, updated state. So I kind of made use of that. Um, that's the state management. We'll see. Uh, I think I'll show you the code later at the end. Um, then um, comes to some performance uh, optimization. Mm, this comes to. Uh, become a problem immediately after I put everything into React. And um, at first, when I built the carousel, um, it turns out to be quite janky. So when I, uh, the first thing is that after you apply a new color, it takes quite some time for it to re-render. And then also when you do the gesture, when you swipe around, uh, it's not smooth. So I was trying to figure out what's going on then. Uh, look at this original photo um, taken by an iPhone 13. Um, it's about uh, 4,000 by 3,000 pixels and 2.3 megabytes in uh, raw format. And then after ChatGPT's work, um, I've got, you see this? Then I think my friend will judge me if I give them 21 megabytes of photo just because I added two borders. Um, I don't know why I checked the PNG though. Yeah, it's not me, it's checked the um, <clears throat> So I told GPT that no, the photos are too big. Are you out of your mind? Then it immediately gave me, oh, you can use JPEG format and you can compress it down. So now we're at 3.5 megabytes. And we want to further um, like, uh, do some more product decisions about resolution and sizes. Well, we're missing a PM here, but don't worry, ChatGPT has got us covered. Um, so I asked it, like, what should be my target resolution? And then it says Instagram uses 1080. And I got DevTools Inspector myself, right? Um, it's 1440 now, two years. A lot can happen. Um, then uh, I did some more product research on what are the input format, uh, I mean the input photos. <laughs> so ChatGPT actually knew uh, that. So at the point of 2021, this is magic year, iPhone 14 Pro didn't exist. But my friend just got a new iPhone 14 Pro, so I had to build for that. And then GPT actually realized that iPhone 14 Pro doesn't exist, but it also know that it's supposed to exist. 
And I actually made some guess, which was pretty impressive. So um, then I asked it to do some performance analysis, kind of asking it, like, uh, what's the performance impact if we're operating on this and this and this um, devices? And then it gave me this series of calculations. And long story short, it will be 8 to 11 times faster if we use Instagram resolution directly. Yeah, so then I'll go, should I opt optimize by drawing smaller resolution or compressing the images? And yeah, it tells me to do both, so let's go ahead and do it. Um, then again, if you're tested in your exam, you should understand what these are doing. So, um, <coughs> turns out I learned something new. Uh, when canvas draw the uh, image of bigger resolution to a smaller resolution, it uses something called a down, called down, down sampling. Right. So the purpose is to reduce the dimensions, but not really relevant to the size. Um, the other one, uh, when you call canvas to data URL, you can specify a um, format, and JPEG and WebP allows a compression algorithm, and you can supply a quality parameter to um, compress it down more, but at a lower quality. And this will give you, um, dimensions still the same, but it will give you a smaller image. So at the end of this round, uh, we come down to 1440 square, and the image is 644 kilobytes. I think that's pretty easy. Yeah, so uh, with the technical uh, tech design done, and then uh, performance more or less acceptable, uh, we can go ahead and do the implementation, and we'll do some code tour. So I'll just show you the code. Yeah. <coughs> like I mentioned, uh, I have three items. I need two items, color and file. Um, and um, we will run the async selector to grab the color and the files. And then we'll run this asynchronous process We'll wait for the image to decode. This will guarantee that the image will display properly. And then <coughs> we will uh, scale down the image um, if necessary. And once we get all the math right, um, ChatGPT did all of this, uh, we can call draw image. And it will return the file name and the URL, which you can then consume for your carousel. So all the other components are relatively straightforward, including the color paper, the uploader, and the gallery. This is my attempt to render the borders. Um, but what I want to share with you uh, on top of everything else is this parasol. Because um, this involves a gesture. Um, so if you are interested in web development and you've never built a gesture-based component yourself, I highly recommend that you try at least once in your life. Um, because it's, um, it's not easy to get it done right. And of course, I also asked ChatGPT again to do this. It gives me a very basic implementation. Um, the idea is the same, but the version it gave me is not so smooth. So I'm kind of taking my advantage as um, a uh, web developer myself, I look into code around me, I look into React swipeable tabs. I kind of learned this from those uh, battle tested components. So, how you do this is um, show you a little diagram. So, you want to render this carousel on your phone, uh, which is of this width. But then you have multiple media that you want to swipe around, so they will all kind of hidden behind the screen. Um, when they land on your phone, uh, you calculate the size of the whole list, and then you put that down on the DOM. As the user swipes left and right, um, if you think about the behavior, when <coughs> your finger is touching the, the screen, 
you want to uh, dislocate the image, but this is only temporary. So once you release the finger, um, you want to reset that uh, to a position that is aligned with your carousel. So uh, once you finish the sliding, whether you render this image or the next active image, you do a credit kick. So that's the general idea. And I'll just quickly go through <coughs> what is happening here. So um, this is very much like writing uh, a driver for a hardware. So the, what API you have gives you a three um, event handler on touch start, which will be called when you start touching. On touch and it will be caught when your finger leaves the uh, the device, and then on touch move is it will keep getting caught when you are moving. So when you uh, when you handle the stacking of the swiping, you will set a few uh, uh, variables to locate the most updated. Um, <coughs> state and uh, I won't go through too much of the detail because you can also ask ChatGPT to explain this to you. Um, as you move, what is really interesting to me is that um, the implementation from React's WebBubble tab uses a velocity-based predicate as opposed to a distance-based predicate. So the more recent event will take more weightage as what happened a few moments ago. So when you update your state, what you do is you take the previous moment velocity multiplied by 0.5, and then you take the most current and multiply that by 0.5. So it's a diminished weightage of what happened earlier on versus what happened now. So finally, when um, you finish swiping, um, you will run the predicate uh, on the threshold and, and then you will do the animation. So, uh, so in the end, you uh, reset the delta of the temporary animation and then you put that back. So that's how you do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I'll show you the app later. You can try it for yourself, see if that's... Uh, smooth enough for, you, for your machine or your device. Uh, the final stage that I've been through is refinements. Uh, actually, I, I'm guilty of spending only 10 minutes on the design. Um, how, how I do this is pretty much just find a font and then find a color. Um, then I also put it in a PWA such that I can use it when the internet is not great. And then I did tracking uh, so I kind of know uh, whether it is being used. Um, so now I have this. Uh, I'll have a cat in my phone, and once you hit open, it will show you the screen. And you can add multiple images and find a color. Uh, this is given by the native of your phone. You can pick a color and pick my shirt's color and apply it to all the photos, and I can download it to my phone. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> this is the app, and this is a GitHub project, so free to uh, take a look. Or maybe if you, if you ever post any square image, you can tag square cat on Instagram, because anything that don't end up on Instagram don't count. So uh, that's a different... Okay, where's my slide? Yeah. So uh, I have links to a few more uh, stuff relevant to this. One is the squareimage.com implementation. They also use Canvas, and I actually learned from them in parallel to ChatGPT, so I don't just copy the answer. I also refer to other things. Um, there's also one minute detail about image.decode, and there's a very amusing article here that actually discuss about it, so it's quite interesting. Um, so I have these two projects. Let's take a look look back on how ChatGPT did. Um, I give the score not based on how 
accurately they give me the answer, but how much I refer to what ChatGPT gave me. So even though it might not be so uh, perfectly accurate, if I can learn something or if I can move in the right direction, I will give it credit. So I find ChatGPT really good at coding generic problem. So if your problem has been solved multiple times by other people, chances are ChatGPT will have a good chance of giving you a good answer because they're really good at uh, people, other people say, I also say. So um, try to describe a problem in a generic and declarative manner. Um, but if you have very specific requirements, that's when I feel more comfortable moving away from ChatGPT because I don't want to wrestle with it. Um, I like how it did on product research and performance analysis. And I think it's really powerful that you can do everything with one interface. Because you can do like, you can ask it to assume your product is based on iPhone 14 and 12, and then target Instagram. Um, I think before ChatGPT, we don't really have a chance to do all of this at, at once. Um, it's very, very good at interpreting code. Uh, I started with like five unicorns, and I realized it's so good at it that I need to give it six. Um, so it didn't give me the most smooth implementation of a swipeable tab, but when I give it the swipeable tab that um, I eventually um, <coughs> tweaked and uh, adopted, and I asked it that, uh, how is this implemented? And it can explain to the, it, it can explain to me the thing as if it coded it itself. So <coughs> I found that pretty impressive. And it's also quite good at explaining technology. I feel it gives you the high uh, level details good enough. Um, and writing talks, we kind of disagree on what is the most interesting part of the problem. So um, I will not score them on that. Yeah. Um, I want to share a few things I learned um, throughout this process. Um, the first thing is you can get up and running very, very quickly. Um, this, um, this gives you um, a lot of free time that um, you can, um, <clears throat> in a sense, like you can um, focus more on what is the actual uh, context or feature that you're building. Um, <clears throat> because it's so good at um, the generic and the common problems, things that have been solved over and over again, um, <clears throat> you can... Um, actually, what I think um, what's really impressive is that um, the crux of the problem has taken like much lesser time than uh, the overall time that I spent on both of these projects. Um, <clears throat> you'll be doing more code review as opposed to actual coding. Um, I don't know whether this will be a problem for um, very for, for all of you who are still in school, um, but actually I find this very valuable because the more senior you will get in an actual uh, software engineering company, the more code review you will be doing as opposed to actual uh, coding. Mm, so, um, actually the most, um, if you become like a tech lead, then you probably won't be implementing uh, on a daily basis, but instead you will be reading a lot of code. And same applies to my manager who doesn't code at all, but uh, you really need to get the gist of what is happening in a large code base uh, very efficiently. So I find ChatGPT give me a very good chance to practice that, uh, it's a very nice coding pal to have. And you also can interpret your code, so you can ask ChatGPT to review your code, so that's super cool. Um, the final point I find, um, I'll probably do this to myself, is that I think it allows me to focus more on defining the problems. So none of this project is given by ChatGPT, if not for the fact that my designer friend has this animation for me to build, and if not for the fact that I really wanted my photos in Square. I wouldn't have worked on this, but all of this is not because of ChatGPT, but rather the problem is there in the first place. So um, if we have a chance, uh, now that ChatGPT gives us 
such a powerful tool to organize our past experience and consume experience from other people and ourselves so, so efficiently, um, it actually gives us a chance to focus more on the problems to ask and the designs that we might come up with. So I think that's the final point I want to share with you tonight. Yeah.